Marshawn Sager here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Good morning, everybody. We were thinking about an episode we needed to cleanse our palates. We're exhausted from debating the Republican Party. <laughs> we are exhausted by the Ukraine discussion that's been going on for a month. Once again, we're podcasters, so I'm not saying the stakes are particularly high when we're exhausted, but we just wanted to do an episode that felt totally out of left field. So we were really excited that we connected with Jimmy Sony. He's the author of The Founders, The Story of PayPal, and The Entrepreneurs Who Shaped Silicon Valley. Sagar, who are those founders, and why does this story actually have relevance to people who are interested in basically all the topics we're hitting today? Yeah, I mean, I, we talk about this with Jimmy, but some of these names, Peter Thiel, David Sachs, Reid Hoffman, Keith Rapport, there are so many people who are on that list who are some of the most important people in technology and in politics today. They've not only backed some of the world-changing companies since PayPal, but PayPal itself was a revolutionary idea that laid the ground for crypto and for a lot of the ways that we talk about online money in the 21st century. So that's why I actually think this book is so important, which is something, Marshall, you and I have found a real niche in, I would think, is looking back deep into history. I mean, people can just see all the books behind me and then trying to find the actual parallels, not the pop history parallels to what's happening today, and then trace the roots of what is actually happening and try and find some way that it rhymes. That's part of the reason I really love talking to Jimmy about this book. Yeah. And don't forget, Elon Musk was also at PayPal as well, too. So basically, right, of course. so yeah. many people who have really big voices today were at this company. So look at the history. It's super interesting. Quick things. One, send a tip. Appreciated. Two, this is a book show. So let's get up to the bookshop. Moved hundred, tens of thousands of dollars of books last year. So I want to move some more. It's Thursday. So let's get the Substack subscriptions going and pump to send that out. And thank you to Lincoln Network. Hope everyone enjoys this episode. Jimmy Sony, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, it's good to see you, man. It's funny. I almost said, and I made this joke with you yesterday, but it's actually true. I almost said, welcome to the deep end, because we also did an episode about this book on the deep end. It's actually going to come out before this episode. So if you haven't checked out the deep end yet, and you're interested in more of the, what are the direct founder venture capital investment operating lessons, definitely check that one out. This is going to be much more of a broader episode. Or, you so, know, not to pl uh, plug you guys, we'll listen to both, uh, subscribe yeah, to both, make sure it. you pay yeah. attention to both. Why not? Rate, subscribe, all <laughs> all of the above, and everybody buy Jimmy's book. So let's get it out of the way. <laughs> there you go. Time. Everybody, everybody yeah. wins. Jimmy, uh, for good or for ill, I read the comments. And a comment recently that came out when I did an episode with Sebastian Malaby about venture capital was the following. I'd like to hear your response. It said, really like the realignment. Most of the episodes are great. Every once in a while, though, these guys just randomly do this episode on tech and they're just like praising these That's guys funny. as if they're God's gift to everything. And I just like don't get it. So I was hyper aware of that comment when we put this on the calendar. So I'd just love for you to respond without defending our editorial strategy broadly. Why right. is that person who was saying this in good faith mostly? What is your response to that person when it comes to why they should be interested in this book? Because I think that to limit the understanding of technology founders, you know, which my specific subset are the group of people who founded PayPal, I think it misses the fact that the story of the cre early stories of creations of companies apply well beyond technology, right? And so, so the idea of I would say in two ways. One is the more narrow kind of the, the call it not even narrow, but the, the wider business world. The the lessons around speed, recruiting, product market fit, marketing, messaging uh, are not tech specific lessons or principles or ideas. What Elon Musk does in the early X.com days is partly what my daughter has to do when we're working on a lemonade stand, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, I mean, there's some definitely some differences, but at the, at the level of just uh, having to ask certain questions, you, you learn a lot in any creative endeavor 
when you study the wins, losses, and maybes in, in, these, in these specific creative endeavors. So that's in the business world. But I would also say that there are characterological lessons that come from these stories, right? And so, especially as the figures who are a part of, let's just say the PayPal story, but really any narrative, as they become bigger figures, you don't just learn like specific lessons on how to achieve product market fit between 1998 and 2002. You actually do learn a way of being, a way of thinking. And, and anybody I think who disputes that, like ignores the fact that, you know, Elon is, is, especially for a certain generation, is not admired because of his wealth. He's admired because he's stretched the ambitions of what was possible in a, in a couple of different fields. And so I, I would say that at the level of there's, a, there's lessons in tech stories that apply beyond tech in the world of business. And then there are lessons about tech founders that can actually be character lessons, that can be life lessons, by the way, for good and for ill. But I, I think that we need to... It, my book, I would actually argue, is not not really a tech book. Uh, it, it's a book about a group of people who come together to solve a big problem, and technology happens to be the backdrop and the stage. But but in a funny way, I if I did anything, I emphasize the humanity and the uncertainty and some of the humor as opposed to sort of narrowly diving into to code writing. See what I love about that answer too, and this is also my subtweet, Marshall, of whoever made that comment is the reason why is because this is a story of the most immense uh, revolution in our economy, culture, and society in, since the Industrial Revolution. So I feel like, Jimmy, if you could outline for us a little bit of, of that story within the book, I mean, we're talking about the 90s and this new thing called the internet, and nobody knew if this was fake or not. And then money? online that's literally nuts it's not nuts now but at the right. time completely crazy i mean what i think you can and hopefully help me or help the audience put us in the minds and the heads of what it was like to work in online financing in the early days of the internet like this and why was it such a revolutionary thing yeah, it's a great question. And the, the, the subtweet to your subtweet, I think, would be, you know, the person's <laughs> yeah. comment was we revere these people as gods. And I would actually sure. argue that gods. to deify them is to do right. them a real disservice and it's to yeah. do ourselves a disservice. Like, actually, what you want to do is you want to bring them down from Mount Olympus, study everything, the flaws, the failures, the yeah. warts, all right. of it, and, and make heads and tails of that. Because if you put them in this sort of like a pantheon, then it becomes like impossible to even think about them critically or to approach what they do as work that is accessible to all of us. So like, let's, let's, I, I appreciate the critical comment. Uh, and hopefully that person, this listens person to this did podcast not know what they were, <laughs> they did yeah. not know what they were getting into yeah. when they randomly left but, a side comment. But to, to Sagar's question more yeah. specifically, so there's this incredible period in the United States from in, in the early, mid, and, and late 1990s. Uh, particularly the mid and late 1990s get referred to as the internet boom, and then there's an internet bust. And my story takes place during that very fertile period, particularly in 1998, 1999, 2000, 2001, which are sort of the two years that characterize the tail end of the boom and the beginning of the bust. And in that milieu, you have Elon Musk, Reid Hoffman, Peter Thiel, David Sachs, and several hundred other individuals, Max Levchin, um, who come together in one place, PayPal, to build a payment processing company. Um, now, neither company, there were two companies that fused together to become PayPal. Neither company actually starts out doing payment processing, right? Like they settle on that as an idea. Right. But originally, Peter Thiel and Max Levchin's company is called Confinity. Their goal, make Palm Pilot money beaming a thing. And Elon Musk has his company X.com. And his goal, completely revolutionize finance from the roots up, leave no stone unturned and upgrade everything about money and the way it works around the world, right? Mod modest ambitions. Um, and so you have these two companies. And what happens is they both find that their products are successful, but the, the key product that is successful in the key place is emailing money on eBay. And so again, at the tail end of the boom and at the beginning of the bust, they have a hot product 
but it's a pretty decent leap from a hot product to a successful business. And what my story covers is like how that happened, who they were, and who are the people both known and unknown who made that made that whole thing come to life. I want you to speak to something that I've felt ever since I started working in tech and soccer, since you're adjacent to it with mm-hmm. what you're doing a supercast and building a business. I'm sure you feel this too. So much of our audience is political news driven. And a lot of our incoming is around, I feel like we can't pass this bill. I can't pursue this goal of mine. The system sucks. Nancy Pelosi's too old. That's basically what listener mail condensed All into true. 15 yeah. seconds. What's so cool about the space you're describing, though, is, and I don't want this to seem just like it's tech, like is amazing and great. What is cool about tech, especially during this early internet era, is you can wake up and say, hey, I want to build a payment process and you can just do that. So can you can, can you just speak to the degree of which what could be driven a lot, uh, driving a lot of people's frustration is that we just can't do things anymore. And it seems like tech is one of those last places. I don't know. That's, that's just like a feeling yeah, no, I've had. I think, I think it's one of the most interesting and important cultural conversations that's happening. And I would actually argue that thankfully there's a whole range on right and left thinkers who are writing about the possibility that we can do things, but that we've sort of convinced ourselves that we can't, right? So you're seeing this with like Katie Boyle's writing on American Dynamism, Mm -hmm. Derek Thompson's writing about this at The Atlantic. You have a whole movement with, you know, Tyler Cowen and Jason Crawford writing about progress studies, right? And what's interesting is like, there's not maybe political unanimity in in even the names I I just mentioned, but there's a, a degree to which they're saying, wait, we, we, we actually can, we can build and we have to actually like celebrate building and the idea that we ought to build. And I did not begin this book with any kind of agenda and there's no sort of advocacy mission at the heart of the book. It is, it is a book of hopefully facts and, and good stories from this period of building. But I, I did find that, that sort of two things. One is the alumni in this group who are some of the most revered entrepreneurs of our day walked it, walked out of it with a predisposition that one could build and be successful, right? Mm. And not not like like retire on a beach for the rest of your days success, but but they could build something, find a customer base, find a paying customer base critically, and and either you know IPO sell the company and move on and do other things. And they they've replicated that model so many times. So during the the height of the internet bust, part of what I did was I went back and I read all these like really dispiriting CNN articles about how like the internet is terrible. It was a total fad. We've got to move on, get back to bricks, not clicks, et cetera. This generation actually emerges and says, you know, we, we kind of pulled it off. Like we didn't think we'd be successful, but we were. So why don't we just go do this again? And that, you know, motivates Yelp, Slide, SpaceX, Tesla, Palantir, Yammer, et cetera. So, so that's one thing is like the, the, the early small success in building something, I think did predispose these people to building. The, the second thing I walked away with was actually a sense that, you know, there's this remarkable anecdote uh, that I, I had a gentleman who was early with Elon at X.com shared with me. He said, you know, he was super early. He was like, he was one of the first four co-founders. He's lost to the sands of time until I sent him a cold email. Um he had once been in Elon's townhouse, uh, where which I believe he shared with his brother. And he was sort of like, like finding the bathroom and like happened to look inside Elon's room. And it was crowded with books, floor to ceiling. And the book that he remembers seeing on the top of one of these piles was a book about Richard Branson. And the line in, in the book that I noted was he said, it, it, he, this person said to me, it dawned on me then that Elon was training for some superordinate goal, that he was actually really thinking about what it meant to to build, to, to create things in the world. And so my, my one of the key takeaways I have, and again, I'm not any kind of advocate, nor am I involved in these policy debates, but I think a culture gets what it celebrates. And if, if you celebrate creators, and if you acknowledge that this stuff is happening, that like Nancy Pelosi doesn't stand in the way, then, then I think you start to shift the culture in a direction where creation becomes a thing that we are doing and ought to continue to do, if that makes sense. And, and by the way, that can seem really basic and simple, except that there's what percentage of our coverage in the world is devoted to politics against what coverage of, in the world might, de- might be devoted to, let's say, startups that aren't you know, multi-billion dollar enterprises, but are maybe at a smaller scale. And there may be no perfect way to do that, except that what I think needs to happen is, is 
we reward and celebrate people who actually do create these things and not just in financial terms, but in, in cultural terms, meaning that they are people who are written up in alumni magazines, not because they won an election, but because they built a business that they are people that are invited to give talks even to, to, to younger generations. And again, I'm not the person who's going to lead that kind of movement, but I, I hope that people do walk away from the, the PayPal story with a sense that, building things is doable if difficult. Yeah, no, it's really true. It's it's a tough problem too, because it's, you know, for all the talk of the cynicism, there's also just outright, you know, snorting your own supply. Uh, right. We see, I think, very, very much across Silicon Valley. An interesting angle I'd like to get into, um, just given our own show's perspective, is it also strikes me looking at the cover of your book, these are some of the most important people in American politics today. Uh, and I'm mm. curious if have you ruminated on that? Um, I mean, Reed Hoffman is arguably the most important donor in Democratic politics today, maybe outside of George Soros. Peter Thiel literally just resigned from the board of Face. Oh, sorry, excuse Meta. Me, Meta. Um, He's its Christian uh, name. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, Meta. <laughs> Meta mates who are out there, cringe. Is that um, the new name? Is, is no. So they're, they're calling each other Meta mates in terms of. Instead of Facebook. Can't even make this up. Yeah, it's unbelievable. (laughs) Anyway, so uh, Peter Thiel resigns from the board of Meta specifically to say, I'm going to fund and push President Trump's America First agenda. David Sachs is host of the All In podcast. He was involved in the recall election against Gavin Newsom. He was involved right now in the successful recall election um, in San Francisco school board. Elon Musk has himself become a, a literal cultural I would say libertarian icon um, of sorts. I just named four people who are incredibly important to the American political system. How have you thought about that? What what part of your story do we have inklings that this would come? Like, what do you think? Yeah. So I, I'll uh, I'll say this. I, I had the wonderful luxury of living under a rock for the last five years. <laughs> And, mm-hmm. and I, I emerged and there were all these new things that were that were created in the world and all these sort of new ways of political thinking and cultural thinking. But but candidly, uh, I spent I, I really tried to follow a discipline in which when you were writing about history, particularly like recent history from 1998 to 2002, the easiest thing to do is to write in light of the present, right? Yeah, and sort of sure. to, to like take the present and turn it into the prism for everything you look at for the past. Mm-hmm. What, what that does though, I think, is it unfortunately distorts the history that you're trying to tell. And so I actually spent a lot of time reading newspapers, clips, blog headlines from 1998, 1999, 2000, 2001, and 2002. And I will freely admit I ignored the vast majority of the news about these people because it also just psychs you out, right? Like I had, I made sure a friend only, only when friends texted me that he was going to host SNL, did I learn that Elon was going to host SNL. <laughs> and, and I did this as a, as an instinct of self-preservation too, because I didn't want to write with any kind of like, well, X, X person is doing Y thing, ergo, I should try to connect it to my narrative somehow. Uh, but that's so that's like an, the unsatisfactory answer that the better answer is, you know, this is a what you the people you just described are politically heterogeneous. They are heterodox in many different ways, but they're politically all over the place. Right. You mm-hmm. just named a foremost Republican donor and a foremost Democratic donor Two people who are on opposite sides of, of this political spectrum, but who were warehoused within one company. And within that company, I found this dynamic. You had people who were just like all over the place politically. I think one of the unfair characterizations of the PayPal story is that it was all sort of political libertarians from Stanford Review, which couldn't be further from the truth. There were people who here were engineers who were apolitical, and there were also like very, very politically inclined people, but the politics actually stopped at PayPal's door in some way, right? So Hmm. within the company, there weren't really, there weren't political litmus tests. They maybe had sort of a faintly libertarian thought process, but honestly, what, what that gave way to was to see exigencies of like product development and building things while the dot-com bubble is bursting, right? And so in a way, I was like wonderfully insulated from politics. There's a couple exceptions. Um, you know, Elon has an extended meditation in the book 
that I, I sort of cite from a conference where he's talking about regulations and what regulations can do to innovation. So the, the intersection and interaction between regula- financial regulations and his budding company X.com is actually a, a thing that becomes difficult in the early part of, of the X.com days. They have to hire a lawyer like almost right away to like actually navigate the thicket of all of the Glass-Steagall and everything else. Um, and then I would say the other thing is there's echoes of cryptocurrency and the kind of modern crypto movement within this within the development of this company. And so you do have like talk of like the world domination index. They want to abolish currencies. They want to create a borderless currency. They want to create a mobile currency. Again, some of that like rhetoric is really good for recruiting. It gives way to the hard reality of building a product. But I would I would actually say that what's interesting about this period is that the the politics for all of these folks are dialed down and the instinct to like build the successful company and do the thing that they're best known for is dialed way, way up. And, and that, I, 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 I suppose I can say nothing about it other than it is the truth of what happened at that time, sure. which is to say it wasn't like they were building PayPal by day and attending the DNC and the RNC by night, right? Like actually what they were doing was building PayPal by day, by night, by weekend, et cetera. And it was a really intense pressurized process. The politics, at least in the the lives of some of the main characters, came much later. And by the way, I also this is not for me. This is not for lack of asking. I did ask, particularly junior level employees, did you ever feel like you know the, the politics became a part of the place? And uh, and it it really it really didn't. Like the, there were just too many urgent things to work on for that to become a part of the story. A deep cut joke that I thought of for our tech audience was when you said, you know, this is more complicated than people going to Stanford. I'm like, yeah, some of them went to Berkeley, dude. Right. Like, let's, right. Let's, come on. Whoa. Yeah. Let's, let's really get to the nuance there. We had both ends of the Bay Area. No, but, you know, I was, I'm thinking hard about why, on a serious note, I was really excited about this book beyond just the fact that the players all are a huge deal today. And, this came through when I was talking with a, a listener um, a few weeks ago who was born in 2001. So this entire story, the dot-com bubble, the boom, like this is actually Sagar in my childhood, like you're a little older than us, like not too much older, but a little older. So like this is your, your present in many respects. Like we were aware of this as it was happening. And there's just, we're going through this weird, not weird because it makes sense. We're in the 1990s nostalgia moment right now fashion culture you're seeing this in documentaries can you just let's just talk about the 90s i mean sorry we're turning 30 this year so this is this is something that's deeply present just talk about the so it's not just start with the end of the boom but just talk about the 90s let's just go yeah i mean this is like a fun book because i got to mention mighty Morphin power rangers right (laughs) uh and you've got mail the the meg ryan and tom hanks movie Mm -hmm. um you know I don't, again, I, I'm not an, a cult, sort of expert on culturally on the 1990s by any stretch, but it, it was interesting to explore a period in which there was still a kind of, at least to me, a fundamental, particularly in, nine, in 98, 99, a kind of fundamental optimism, right, that, that pervaded the, the thinking and the writing, right? So before you get to the fears about Y2K and like, like think think back to that. We thought like the digits changing in a calendar year, we're going to inaugurate like planes falling from the sky and, you know, buildings crashing and stuff. And it turned out none, none of that actually happened. But there is this real sense, you know, on the West Coast, but I think kind of a, a, a throughout the country that that technology was inaugurating and could change everything. Right. So Ideas that seem mundane to us today, pet food delivery, were thought of as revolutionary back then, right? right? Online dating is arriving on the scene. We might change romance. We might change the way our pets eat. We might change the way we book travel and everything. And all of it has this kind of glitter about it, right? There's excitement and energy and money. Some of that obviously like kind of craters as soon as 2000 and 2001 start, but to my mind, at least looking back, like one of the stories of the 90s is this is this sense of, of optimism and buoyancy within the country. Now, that also, though, is like I don't want to paint too rosy a picture because there were a couple of economic crises internationally. There was the Asian financial crisis. Right. There was a recession in the early 90s. Uh, there were, you know, all kinds of political convulsions. You see the rise of, a, of a, what I would argue is a more combative politics. Right. This is the sort of. Gingrich revolution. There's a lot of like, you know, you, you sort of see the boxing match get started in a pretty intense way. Um, and I, I also think it's important when you're doing history, not to like be dewy eyed about it. Like this was a really hard period as well. 
Um, but within uh, on the streets of the place that I wrote about, it was a time of real energy, a time of real optimism. Luke Nosick is one of the figures in my book, and he describes like the desire to come west. Right. Just the idea of like the West was a magnet, like I'm going to go to California and I'm going to make make it out there. Um, one of the people in this story, Scott Bannister, Scott Bannister, Luke Nosick and Max Levchin go to UIUC together, University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. And if there can be said to be a soul of the place, I would actually argue it's UIUC, not not Stanford. Um Standing up for my Midwesterners is a true Illinois, a son of <laughs> Illinois. Uh, and so. Scott Bannister drops out of UIUC and packs up and moves west and builds a company and successfully sells it. Luke Nosick follows quickly in his heels to do somewhat of this, to do, try his hand at the same thing. Netscape has just gone public and Mark Andreessen is on the cover of Time Magazine. And the, ner the, the nerds are excited. The nerds are, are at last getting their revenge, right? Like this is, this is going to happen. And it's, it's a mix of technological optimism, but also that the technology isn't something I'm building in my basement to show my friends, but that it can actually put me on the NASDAQ and on the covers of magazines. So you have a connection between those two things. And, and to my mind, like that's the, there's like real energy there, real excitement there. And obviously some people I think are more strategic about it than others. A lot of the people I interviewed said, look, I, jo I joined this company somewhat in happenstance or on a lark, but I did get that from the nineties that it was this, that there was it's a stretch to call it a renaissance, but it was a time of real generative building in this particular industry. And, and I hope some of that comes through on the page. You know, the wheel turns <laughs> and things, things get dark and difficult pretty quick. But that is how I, I sort of think about that. Time. I also live this, as you said, I lived this period. And I remember getting my first computer it was sort of my hot rod, which shows you how cool or not cool I was, right? I remember buying parts at Best Buy and assembling machines and building things and having a real sort of tactile connection to the technology that I think is sometimes absent today. Uh, that's how I hope people see it, particularly for this cluster of engineers at UIUC. Mark Andreessen had blazed a trail. And it's a really amazing thing to see the way that that halo effect extends to their lives. So this is really interesting in terms of the 90s and considering everything within the public context. I guess one of the things I wanted to follow up and pull the thread on was crypto. Mm. You know, let's pull the thread of online commerce, rethinking finance, tracing it from Elon Musk to kind of crypto thought that we have today. Can you give us some of the origins of that? Yeah, it's it's threaded throughout throughout the book um, in a few different formats. One is just the mere rhetoric of like we're going to change money forever is 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 a part of the ambitions of these two companies that become PayPal, right? So for Elon, the view is well, money just has bad systems, old mm -hmm. code, really like stodgy mainframes. Banks and governments alike just need an upgrade. And by the way, like. There was an article today about how the IRS is still running systems on COBOL. So like he's, his critique still stands even in 2022, 20 years later, right? Um, he had this great line that he said to me, he's like, oh, I pity the poor bastard who has to work on COBOL, right? Um, and so there, there's that critique. There's also for Luke Nosick, Peter Thiel, really Luke and Peter are the kind of ideological wellsprings of this, this idea that uh, coming out of a series of international financial crises in 1997 and 1998, uh, where currencies like values went up and down in a kind of seesaw fashion, that what it was doing was like robbing people of their wealth uh, and, and of, of, of a fundamental stability in their country. So their view was like, if we could make Palm Pilot currencies a thing, then we could help really like release populations from the shackles of these of these things, right? Which mirrors some of the rhetoric you hear about it today. Um, as I as I take a step back from the story and sort of think about what are actually the the connections, the most powerful one to me is this. I don't know. I'm not conversant in the language of crypto and Web three, and I and I'm not going to even pretend to like know what an NFT is, right? Except I love that Alexis Gay video where she sort of tries to describe all this stuff. It's yeah, like one of my favorite mashups. Yeah. Um, here's what I will say. In the same spirit in which the 90s drew a young generation of technologists and nerds and engineers and product people out West to try to build things to see what would work, it strikes me that internationally what, what this, this new domain 
the, the crypto and Web3 worlds, what they've done is actually light a similar fire. You have an entire new generation of people who are building things with one another, trying to generate value, trying to generate wealth, and they can do it without being bound by location. They can do it because technology has progressed to a point where it's possible. And they all have like various big ambitions, right? Whether it's like upturning the Federal Reserve or, you know, figuring out how to do payments in a very narrow sector. But to me, what, what, what I think of is the actual accumulation of that kind of ambition and energy, which I take to be a net good, right? Like you, you can think what you may think, but when, when these people in the PayPal story begin the process of founding a company, they also set themselves up to, to do this in perpetuity, to think of it as a normal thing to do. And as I've spoken with friends who are in this, in, in Web3, like the thing they're excited about is building, right? Like one of the hallmarks of that community is that, is this GM, like they'll tweet mm. GM, right? It's time to build. And, yeah. Totally. Yeah. And it's like, it's a conveyance of like optimism and buoyancy at a time, by the way, they, they started that during like a pandemic, during a very dark yeah. period in like human history. Um, they managed to capture something there. And I don't know, like in, in a universe in which you don't have much to hang, hang your hat on and where things seem bad all the time and where there's a lot of doom and gloom. There are thousands of people tweeting GM every morning like that. I, I don't know how you could look at that and, and actually embrace a widespread cynicism. Um, the final thing, this is just an Easter egg, is that, you know, Peter Thiel has some pretty interesting thoughts about Satoshi and who, who he is. Mm-hmm. Right. Which is sort of buried in the book. We, we had ta- he and I had talked about it. Um, there's also a little line in the end note, which gives some more specific theories about why you'd look for Satoshi in a certain place. But there was an international financial cryptography conference in Anguilla, which is this island um, that both he and Max Levchin attend. Uh, Max attends in 1999. I believe that both of them attend in 2000. They, they harbor suspicions that Satoshi might have been at this, at this conference, that he may have been in the room, right, hovering about, trying to like figure out what he's going to do. Interestingly, PayPal succeeds just as a whole range of digital currency startups start uh, fail. And uh, famously, Max Levchin attends the bankruptcy party for Digicast just before he creates PayPal. And so I also take that actually as, as a sign that, sure, we're going to see a lot of things in the, in the cryptocurrency world go belly up, but that may be the, the antecedent step before something really succeeds. Uh, and again, I am not at all conversant in what that world is about, but I can talk about some of the, the hallmarks that or the echoes that I see from the PayPal years. So this is a uh, follow-up question that I have here, which I think is important, which is in, given that some of the PayPal, given some of the most successful PayPal story itself actually happened during the bust, what then can we think about in terms of the through line between the lessons of the leaders through the most egregious part of the dot-com burst and then kind of to that Web3 optimism because i think like you just said you know people are tweeting gm and and trying to build something in a really bad time given that paypal itself some of their most innovative times were doing and were forced um during artificial constraints can you talk a bit about that some of the history with paypal yeah you know it's interesting if you in, in looking back at the history I would actually argue that had PayPal been created in 1996 or 1997, it's possible that there would not have been enough external pressure to lead them to their successes because they would have been able to just continue to sort of raise money as needed. The company in March of 2000 raises a $100 million round, and it's about a week before the NASDAQ begins its first big dip. And the NASDAQ sort of, you know, tops out at 5,000 or so points and loses, uh, I think it's at 1,100 or 1,200 by 2002, right? So a very significant, this is the sort of crucible of the dot-com bus. Um, Part of what happens is that 100 million starts to evaporate really quickly. And their advisors and board members tell them like, you're not going to raise another nine-figure round. Like this, that's that's not going to happen. We have to figure out how to right-size the business. The next two years of the PayPal story are spent right-sizing the business. And so- I, I, what I took from that, and not just what I took from that, what others who lived this story took from that was the power of external pressure to discipline a company to create products and services that are actually used and to create a revenue model and a cost model that makes sense. And so that is, I don't think you can actually, you could try to artificially create those constraints, but it's a hell of a different thing when you know, your neighbor startup 
has their windows boarded up and you're reading the sort of latest ledger of, of you know, the, 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 the pets.com catastrophe and its cousin catastrophes from that year. And you recognize you've got about six months of runway left and you've got to figure out how to make the business work. You've got to figure out how to charge for your products and services. Like this difficult period created a dynamic within the company where the company had to be successful. And so, for example, fraudsters are fleecing them for millions, right? Mm-hmm. Millions of dollars. You in a, in a headier time when you could just do another big nine figure round of fundraising, you may be able to kick the can down the road on solving fraud. But in s- summer of 2000, when the money is gone and everyone says the internet is over, you're not going to do that. And so what you end up having to do, which is exactly what the team does, is solve fraud, figure it out, defeat the fraudsters, attack the problem with real energy and aggressiveness. And I had person after person tell me, they said, you know, one, one, one person, um, a QA analyst uh, said, at, this, at the time in this company, no matter what level you were at, you always felt like the company hung on your shoulders, that like you could be the bottleneck, right? And so in a way, like the pressure is powerful. It's generative. It's good. I mean, it leaves like it leaves some real <laughs> scars, but it actually led them to their greatest successes. So to the extent that, you know, we've sort of coasted along or companies feel as though they have, or maybe the economy in some sense feels like it's overheated, you know, PayPal was born in the correction and they got lucky in several respects, but part of what, in some ways, part of the luck was the correction started and they had to figure out the business really, really fast. You know, here's something I'm curious about as we're thinking of this 1990s backdrop theme, so many early companies, like really, if you zoom out from just the specific thing they're doing, they really do like change everything, right? So hmm. the the newspaper is actually just killed by the internet. Traditional media in many ways is killed by the internet in terms of the way it was constructed, the assumptions, those different bits, just the transition from like paper to no more geographic limitations. See this in so many different ways. If you're looking though at this story and the most ambitious Elon Muskian discourse, it was this stuff is going to fundamentally transform money. And if you extend that, this is going to transform the existence of the nation state. And if you extend that, this is going to lead to that, once again, borderless, like libertarian world you're talking about because so many of the things that the government's able to do don't basically work there. Um, This is going to sound familiar to basically anyone who is into Bitcoin because this is what a lot of people talk. And now you have people, and I think this is not really it on a couple of different levels, who say DAOs and Web3 is going to just like replace the nation state on and on and on and on and on. Why did the original very libertarian vision for what PayPal's technology was going, what it started, why did that not come to pass in ways that other internet disruptions did? Like why did the nation state and money just survive all this? Yeah, I will speak about it from the perspective that I know best, which is the development of the product. Uh, there is a way in which the rhetoric about financial revolution is the most powerful way to recruit someone to do the thing you want to do, right? Which would you rather join? A company that's promising total financial revolution or a company that's going to make it marginally easier to pay on eBay using email-based payments, right? Like, mm-hmm. like pick, your, pick your team, right? Um, Meaning big visions attract ambitious people. They attract energetic people. They attract people who feel like, yes, we are going to do this. We are going to change the world. And we can parody that and satire that all we want. But damn it, if it's not a good recruiting tool, right? Um, it, it, is, it, it, it suggests high standards, big goals, something that is bigger than you know, this, this, uh, the, the, the simple trading of bits and bytes on the internet, right? And so in one sense, the, the narrative succeeded because it attracted people who were drawn to that narrative, to drawn to the bigness of the vision. But I would say that part of what the company had to do, and a, a few people are key to this, including David Sachs, is is they, they ended up actually thinking a lot about why it was important to, to monopolize a small market on eBay with their payment services, and then to use that as a foothold to go to other markets strategically. So they went from vision to business, right? Which is like actually exactly the transition that you want for something like this, meaning that 
it, 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 they, they weren't running for office to try to rewrite the rules of American finance from within. What they had built was a product that had a very specific use case. It found a home on eBay, and then they just got their tenterhooks in and grew it from there to what it is now, which by the way, today, PayPal is a $300 billion company that in some sense like does power worldwide finance. It didn't upturn it, but it's certainly one of the key rails in contemporary finance. And so you could argue that like actually the the... The, the narrowing of the vision, the clipping of the wings is what led them to having a successful company. Um, but I, I would say that, you know, the vision drew great people and it made people inspired to, especially particularly on Elon's side of the company, people got really fired up by that vision, by the idea that X.com, his company was going to just do everything, mortgages, insurance, lines of credit, all of it. And so I, I don't want to discount it because it, it's there's power there. What What's, you know, one one has to then discipline that to actually build something that has customers, revenue, a reasonable cost model, can go public. And, and you know, there are still people today who are alums who smart at the fact that the company was sold to eBay, who sort of dispute that it should have happened. But if you look at the history of the company, you had really smart people like David Sachs who said, look, we have found product market fit. We've got to get this thing into a business. I suspect, though I have no way of knowing, a great many of the projects that exist within Web3 are going to have a similar process of maturation where they discover that they have a really specific use case. They are very, very successful and they conform themselves to the existing limits of the system. That may not work for some of the people in the company. They may be really actually grouse at that, but I would actually regard it as like a healthy process of building something useful in the world. There's a really powerful quote in the book where Elon's reflecting on what a company does. And he sort of boils it down. He says, like, a company is supposed to do useful things, right? Like, you're supposed to create value in the world. And, and I, I think that is, that, you know, there's always a tension there between sort of revolution and evolution. But uh, I think everybody in the PayPal story would be relatively comfortable with agreeing that the evolution into a, a email-based payment system uh, was, the, was the right move. Man, what's so interesting here, because I'm I'm trying to think of the bits for the non-business tech startup part of the audience, and the process you described actually kind of gets at this because, once again, the dilemma I raised at the start of the episode was people feel like things can't happen. It feels like change is incremental or non-existent. So there's a world where people could learn how, whether you're an activist or you're trying to get into politics, you could have this big vision. Mm -hmm. Um, let's say you're, you know, on the Trump right, it's like America first or build the wall. Or if you're on the left, it's the green new deal. If you're on the center, something centristy, um, don't really know what that quite thing would be, but that's the idea. And then the goal of a successful person in that context is you pair, you find the specific thing that you could do within that because the vision is the rallying cry. The thing mm -hmm. that's hard though, is that in politics, the vision actually usually is the thing. So mm. it's hard. So, so once again, like you said, at PayPal, because to quote Don Draper, that's what the money's for. You're, you're getting paid. So even if you're the libertarian who's going to upend the Fed, you're like, look, dude, we just IPO'd and you got a very nice house. You're able to make it work. But if you're just, you know, in a political movement or you're just, you're just a part of a mission oriented project, that pairing back process must feel pretty demoralizing. So you don't uh, have to have like a, bro yeah, yeah we will love to hear yeah. just your reflection on I would, that. I would say maybe yes, uh, yes and no. And, and I'm actually going to correct what I said earlier. It wasn't an abandoning of the vision. It was a changing of the vision. And here's the way it changed. PayPal began as with the idea that mobile payments were going to change money forever and that you and I were going to be able to use our Palm Pilot. And if you traded in Russian rubles and I was in the American dollar, we'd have no problem exchanging money such that if the ruble decided to collapse again, you could get your money out and you wouldn't, you wouldn't be destitute. Here's what it evolved to. The, the vision later was, you know, Marshall, if you run a small eBay business and you're doing pretty well, Visa and MasterCard are still not going to treat you as a, as a small business or as a credit card process. You're going to have no ability to actually like get credit card payments. So we're going to small D democratize payments around the world. We are going to make it possible for every single person on earth to run a business if they want to. 
that is still an expansive vision. And mm. it is still what drew people to the company. I had people, there's a woman named Denise Aptekar, who was a part of the product team. She played that mission back to me with as much conviction in 2021 as she had in the year 2000. And so there was that mission and vision, the big ideas at the heart of it, but it became about democratizing business and helping these people actually plug into the economy. Because a lot of what was happening on eBay was like folks who started their business as a garage business, maybe it grew a little bit. They still have no ability to be like actually recognized by, by Visa and MasterCard. PayPal is going to fill that gap. There were people fully and completely bought into that vision. And I think you know, with, with proper justification, that's exactly what the company was there to do. So it wasn't that they went from like vision to no vision, right? It wasn't sort of that they went from like, you know, uh, sort of that the vision thing joke, right? From like Bill Clinton to George HW, right? Like it wasn't, it wasn't that. Um, it was that the vision changed, the narrative changed, and it, it, it accustomed itself to the company's actual product. Uh, I don't think that process, by the way, is ever tidy. I don't think you sit in a boardroom and like decide that that's the way it's going to go. I think it's a mix of identifying like, what are people actually using this thing for? Okay. Mm -hmm. How are we going to adapt and inspire our next generation of employees? Great. What do we believe in all of that? Um, that said, just to be clear, like for a lot of these people, this was their first startup out of the gate. They weren't speaking in these terms. This was about survival. This was about, we've got, we've got a hot product. We've got a little bit of money. There's not a lot of money coming in. We got to figure this out. So it was, again, it was, it was a baptism by fire. Yeah. It's, it's actually fascinating to think about it from that way. You know, the part that kind of gets me, which I would love to be able to get back to was there was a deep, and this was, I was getting at in the crypto question. There was like a deep idealism to the early days of PayPal. And like you really, they truly believe they were going to change the whole world. Like, they're like, money's antiquated. The system's money doesn't make any sense. Why can't the ruble and all that just get traded instantly? Doesn't make any sense in the year, which at the time was the present, and it felt like so much was happening. Like, in the year 1999, the Matrix just came out. It was awesome. Uh, what happened, I guess, in the story kind of since then? So, to Peter Thiel, and I know you're focused there then, but we look to now. Teal is most famous for, we were promised flying cars and all we got was 140 characters, now 280 characters. Uh, that Progress. Kind of, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack. His greatest move while he was on the platform. And now we have 280 characters. Cool. Uh, my iPhone, I forget what it is, 13, I think. It looks pretty much the same as my I mean, iPhone 4. It's definitely better. It's faster, but it looks the same. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, new camera, cool. Okay. Um, but we're not talking anything truly revolutionary. What happened to that spirit, man? Like that spirit was unique and it was cool and it was something. Um, am I am I just overlooking some of the optimism and stuff that might be out there? Or was that just a very unique period of time and all of that that made that possible? It's, yeah, it's it's a fantastic... It's a fantastic question. And I, I sort of pause when I'm thinking about it because I don't want to oversell the past and treat this into the glory days, right? Because we're also talking about a time when I read this article from 2000 and I included it, part of it in the book. The CNN FN asks a portfolio manager toward the tail end of the year 2000, what would you do? What stocks would you invest in? And his line is, I would wait and let the angel of death gather up the corpses first, <laughs> right? So yes, it was a time of optimism part of the time. And then it went into, it curdled into real pessimism and fear. Um, and, and again, justifiably, the trillions of market cap vanished overnight, seemingly overnight. So you don't want to oversell the idealism. What I would, what I would say is the idealism exists now but I suspect that it is, it is harder to keep the flames alive for some reason, right? Or that, or that maybe being idealistic now is sort of like, like you can't do it because you're not sarcastic or cynical enough, right? It's sort of Seinfeld 2.0, right? Like, like Web 3 arrives with Seinfeld 3, right? Or, or something like that, that it's not cool to be this, to be optimistic or idealistic in that way. But, uh, but also I actually challenge my own premise there because I, I think that there is still a wellspring of optimism about the prospects for technology and technological development. I think though that 
if we're not careful, we risk extinguishing that. It is part of what impresses me about Web3 that I think that there is still that fundamental idealism. It's part of what impresses me about the movement in technology from bits uh, to atoms, meaning, you know, you can people can believe whatever they want about his politics. But I will let me share a story, an anecdote that I think illustrates the point. I live on a, I have a daughter uh, and we have a young na- a neighbor with young kids and I arrange, you know, play dates and we do things and have them over dinner. And there's these two boys. One is a 13, one's like 10, Joey and Dan. And I had mentioned to Joey and Dan, they said, what are you doing? I said, I was working on this book. And it's, you know, it's Elon Musk is one of the characters and their eyes lit up. And their eyes, like mm-hmm. they went, they, they like bugged out. And Dan starts just going on and on about how he's the coolest. And, you know, he played video games. And I play video games. And I, man, it'd be so cool. Like, I want to know about this. And I want to know about rockets. And I want to know about cars. And so, you know, we could, we can at our level, like argue about his, his you know, these donations to charity or whether he does or doesn't live in a $50,000 house. But we miss the fact that five days ago he was elected to the National Academy of Engineers and that my, my two you know, young neighbors are obsessed and actually want to do what he does, right? And so in the same way that like Sputnik is maybe the negative example because what Sputnik did was it fired up America's competitive instinct and it began the space race. And then you had a generation of astronauts and a generation of NASA engineers that inspired a lot of scientific and technological development. That is happening now. We should nurture it, not extinguish it. And I think we have to look at the reaction of young people to the things that he does. It it, it is not the conversation that's dominant on Twitter. It is not the conversation that's dominant in the editorial pages of most newspapers. And but but it is actually a thing that people are inspired by. And I think it's the reason that he is popular is that he is actually asking us to like stretch our own horizons. And he does it by the way, not consciously. He's not like sitting around thinking that he's doing this. But when I listen to these kids talk about him and they speak about his engineering exploits, I'm just like, great. Like we, this is why this is important because Dan now wants to do rockets. Great. Let's, let's encourage this, this behavior, right. And this sort of thinking. So I think the idealism is there. And, and again, I, I'm sure what you're going to hear is like, that's too Pollyanna or it's too, it's too simplified or whatever, but, but there is a powerful current of interest in him that extends not from his wealth, but from his capacity to build things. And that's happening in many different domains. Right. And so I'm not sure that the idealism isn't there. I think it is. I think we've got to, we've got to play it up, right? Let's let, that's the soundtrack I want. Certainly the soundtrack I want for my daughter. Yeah, so my last bit here is I'm really interested in just like the narrative around tech. Um, And you're a historian who's writing about the tech space and the conclusion, this isn't my, this isn't my take. So (laughs) I forgot whose take it is. So apologies for the lack of sight. But someone basically said today, we can all agree 2012 to 2013, 2014, 2015, there's probably just like a little too much like tech, like Get Elizabeth Holmes on the Forbes cover for a little due diligence. <laughs> too many just breathless profiles, a little too much tech crunch. Like this company raised a trillion dollars. This is and that. What I think happened, not even I think happened, this very clearly happened is the tech industry, the 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 industry that covers tech saw that they overdid it in one direction. And now we're at the point where I can't read another Facebook exposure book. I, I, I actually, I, I, you know, we had oh. the two reporters from the New York <laughs> Times on. I enjoyed the conversation. I think Facebook is very important, but I just cannot do another, you know, Frances Haugen's going to have a book. I doubt she'd come on the show. Um, actually, that'd be kind of fun. I, we will have Frances Haugen on the show. She, she has an open invitation. Yeah. Second you know. tier Frances Haugen, who we know is shopping a book right now. I know you're out there, <laughs> whoever you are. I just don't want to do it anymore just because we get it. <laughs> Like we know tech can be good. Tech can be bad. That is my takeaway. And I'm looking to basically as we're thinking about these things as tech becomes everything, just have just like down the middle coverage. Mm. What, 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 I, I want to find a healthy medium and I'm not sure where they're. I think, I think books like yours 
would maybe feel like cringe. No offense if this was 2016. Right. But I think the pendulum's kind of swinging because I kind of want some optimism about people building things. Yeah. I, I, I really do. You know, like um, I'm thinking about that. So just what's your reflection on this pendulum swinging, the narrative, like where we're at, how we should tell these stories? Because like you said, you're doing the past, but as a historian, you know, that could shape the present. How does yeah. that fit together? And and by the way, just I don't run away from some of the more ethically complicated things that these people did to build PayPal, right? When you're using PayPal to enable gambling payments and you know, you're interfacing with the Secret Service and you're dealing with fraud and you're dealing with human trafficking, like you've got some real moral responsibility there. And I explore that, especially in the later part of the book when the company grows, because you can't ignore that and you shouldn't. Like it's important actually to take a critical look at some of this. And and I, you know, I, I sort of I argue that like there are some moments where they're a little aggressive. The reader will have to determine whether they were appropriately aggressive or egregiously so. It's not like I don't like I'm not going to cast judgments. I'm going to give you the facts. Um, here's what I would say. Like, you know, there, there, there has to be room in the world for Walter Isaacson's Codebreaker and for bad blood. Right. We've got to be able to keep the worst of the worst excesses and faults in check and that's the role of the fourth estate and of enterprising reporters like John who did bad blood, right? Like, because he exposed something that, that needed to be exposed at the same time. Like, I think we, you're right. We shifted into this place where all tech was bad tech, <laughs> right? Where tech could do no, at first it was tech could do no wrong. Then it was tech could do no right. And I think we're trying to find a, a, a healthy middle. I, I would argue that part of what has happened is that tech when we say tech, we mean like probably three companies, right? Or four companies. Yeah. And, and actually what's so hugely interesting to me is that the most powerful response to my book has come from people abroad who are building small companies you've never heard of, who are just excited about the fact that Elon, Peter, David, Max, Julie Anderson, Amy, these people suffered to build. Like uh, Literally the number one comment to me from abroad is, Hey, it just feels real good that these guys were anxious too, because I'm anxious as hell. And that's mm -hmm. really like, I'm just glad they were scared too, right? And so I, I think that there's room for that middle. Where, what I tried to orient, it, where I tried to orient the direction of my book was not on like grand theories of technology, but actually just on like the everyday humanity of recruiting. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe that is the middle, right? It's sort of like people who join Facebook today or Meta today are not joining because they want to be a part of, you know, something they're, they're not joining to do bad things. And I think that's sort of like, we, we, you know, meaning like, I think it up, we have to ask ourselves at the level of the individual, what are these things? What are these motivations? Why do these people join? What are they doing? Those stories tend to have a lot of texture, nuance, uncertainty, and frankly, like dumb luck too. Right. And so I would I would just argue, like if I could argue for anything and I don't know that I'm in a position to, it would be to restore the humanity at the heart of some of this. Um, I promise you there were people who joined Theranos with the very, very best of intentions. In fact, you know, there are because some of them were whistleblowers later. Right. That's right. right. Yeah. And so so to my mind, like I, I, I am very careful about painting with too broad a brush on any subject. But it's sort of like on tech in particular, first of all, what isn't tech? Number one. Number two, like let's treat tech not as like Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter. You know, there's a sort of wide ecosystem of people who are doing amazing things. I, I suspect we could stand to benefit from just shifting the lens a little and also focusing on the individuals at the heart of those stories. I think that's really well said, Jimmy. Uh, I think people are going to get a lot out of the book. Uh, I think it's important, especially at a time like this, like you said, in 2022, to have a retrospective. So I'm really glad that you did it, man. Uh, we're going to have a link down in the description for people to go and buy it. But I really enjoyed talking to you. It was fun. Shout Thank out, you. Uh, Likewise. Jimmy, yeah, and, uh, for, for listeners, shout the book out. We'll do it, of course, but it's different. Yeah. It comes from the author. <laughs> yeah, no, it's called The Founders, uh, The Story of PayPal and the Entrepreneurs Who Shaped Silicon Valley. And I, this was, I appreciate contextualizing the conversation because as I said, and this is important, I was living under a rock guys. Like <laughs> I was waking thing. up, I that's was waking up thing. and reading blog. I was worried about Y2K, right? In, in 2021, I was worried about Y2K. It sounds kind of cool. To be it was, <laughs> it's way less scary than a lot of what's happening yeah. right now. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so wish I was doing that. Yeah. But for me, it, it's, you know, I, 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 it's also like I became a parent in the course of writing this book. And I obviously like mentioned that a couple of times on this, on this thread. And mm -hmm. I really, I really think of this too, as uh, I see how, how natural kids are at building things. 
And to me, like what I like about this story in part is the instinct to build is very much alive and well, and we don't have to look too far for it. I think we've got to build in the right ways. And there's, you know, certainly ethical and moral guidelines and considerations. But I, I hope what people get out of it is the belief that you can still build things and that actually what's important is finding a really di interesting, diverse, heterogeneous group of people to do it with who end up being, you know, very smart. And these, some of these people um, go on to change our world forever. Well, well said, said, Jimmy. Thank you for joining us on The Realignment. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys.